good morning or even good evening at whichever part of the world from your from where you're joining us this is kv prem raj on behalf of bloom wishing you all a very very merry christmas and in a week from now a very happy new year too we have with us a special guest today in shankar i'll just give a brief about him and then i'll hand it over to him. shankar vishnath is a fellow chartered accountant with approximately 29 years of rich local and international experience with various multinational companies in the areas of finance audit consulting and operational aspects his exposure pans across consulting pharma healthcare media and advertising he's also had been into shipping freight and forwarding banking financial services gems and jewelry liquor retail manufacturing education and the hospitality sector he has also 8 years experience in delivering and facilitating training programs as a full time learning and development professional shankar aims to make his training programs workshops a tangible experience focusing on making the learning experiential engaging and fun with real life examples than mere knowledge transfer he feels that in this manner the learners are able to relate better to the programs workshops as well as to their real life experiences he firmly believes that we have all the resources within ourselves to excel in any field we may choose so i've just given a brief about you i would love if you can talk a bit more about yourself your journey as a professional and then moving into the lnd space and you have about 5 to 7 or even more time sure so good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are a merry christmas to all of you uh thank you at the onset team bloom for having me over and giving me this opportunity to share my views my thoughts so yes the journey started in a very very small town in a place called atingal which is in kerala and i was born there and then my father along with all of us migrated to hyderabad so initial schooling happened in hyderabad and then 79 is when we came over to mumbai and since then we've we've been in mumbai so it's it's been a good 43 odd years in mumbai for all of us uh did not get great marks in 10th standard and uh, got into a good college narsi monji just because of local affinity being in the ville parle area and that's how the journey into the commerce field started an interesting incident here we had given vocational guidance test career counseling as they call today in 1982 and i got 143 as my iq iq score and i am told it is very high i i have no idea but my my daughter tells me it is very high and those days the assessor wrote a note saying that you are highly analytical highly scientific your father is in the science field your brother is in the science field so you should take science as a stream and not commerce but i had this in my mind that i want to be a ca i have a distant very distant relative who is a ca and who's always dressed like like how i am right now i remember that whenever i have met my father in terms of you know uh, grow, you grow up and then you you meet your father when he's working and he used to work for golden tobacco the cigarette factory and whenever i have i've seen him he's been full of dust because he was a engineer he was on the shop floor and so i don't want to become like that i want to be somebody like this just the look part of it so that's how the journey into the the stream started little knowing that it's going to be a tough journey failed 10 times in the process before i qualified as a chartered accountant uh, so this was between 85 to 1990 and then of course was very proud that with all this what happened i got into a consulting group 
A.F. Ferguson and company, the then KPMG, Pete Marvick, and then the corporate journey started through the consulting. Yes, fast forward, wanted to be a CFO because in the commerce stream, I think that's the highest that one reaches in terms of designations by the age of 40, got through it, became a CFO in a multinational company in Kuwait, completely different from what I was doing till then. So till then it was consulting, media, advertising and all that. And this is into automation control solutions, a completely different outfit. But I was, I was proud that I got that. I got that in the competition from people from Asia, Brown, Bavari, Invensys. I bet all of them, again, grace, divine grace. And I got that. So basic aspiration of life fulfilled by the age of 38. Worked for another 10 years, reached higher levels, became a, a regional finance director with one more media conglomerate in Middle East and North Africa. Was the regional finance head for the MENA region, handling about 64 companies in 14 countries. Great experience, implemented Oracle in about eight countries. And 2010, my father, who's a saint, is a sannyasi, he's renounced everything in life, leads a secluded life, currently is living with us. He called me saying that, Shankar, I want one of you, if possible, we are two brothers, me and my elder brother, one of you to come back if you can. I am losing confidence. He was about, this is 2010, yeah, I was about 78 then. So I dropped everything and uh, came back to India. There was a tremendous brain drain that has happened because of six years being away from this field. So, you know, no service tax, no income tax, no corporate laws, nothing, nothing, nothing over in the Gulf region. But that is compensated by a little bit of money gain. There was a brain drain, money gain happened. So I was at home for six months when we came back in 2010. Then my final journey in the corporate world started when I joined a consulting group again. And 2014, another major incident happened in my life. It's personal, so I'm not going to talk about it. However, it changed my life completely. Something had to be done where that needed at least, at least my full attention. And the only thing I could have possibly given up is the corporate journey, which was taking about 10, 12, 14 hours of my life. And being in a place like Mumbai, we all know how, how difficult travel is. It takes about three, four hours of your life every day in, in traveling. And then you are saying that you're working for eight hours, but you're not. You're working for eight, 10, 12 hours every day. 2014, this happened. And, and that was the last nail in the coffin. And I thought I must come out of it to settle that issue. But little knowing, what am I going to do? I had no idea. A back office guy, a CA, a completely, you know, yes, doing exciting stuff, no doubt, but considered as a mundane job, a back office, you know, desk job. So I went to this institution to see if I can sort out that issue which was happening in my life. It concerns my daughter. So that, that's all I'm saying. So let me leave it at that. And they said, she is too young. Nothing can be done at this point. But we see potential in you. And, and uh, I said, what potential? So they said, you have this corporate backing. You are, you are a good communicator. You, you express yourself very well. So if you think, you know, you can get into the L&D space. Wow. Maybe always wanted to be a teacher. And that, that stimulus came again. And that's how my foray into the L&D space happened. And then as they say, the rest is history. There is no looking back. In the last eight years, by the grace of divine, I've been able to touch about 18,000 lives with a host of certifications, good, bad, ugly. I'm not getting into that. But yes, those have helped me to improve my knowledge. And uh, I think now it's time to give back. I, I don't even know what we are giving back. Everything of what we have taken is from the universe. So what are we going to give back to the universe? And, and we were just talking before the start of this, this program that, yes, I am a tiny speck in that universe somewhere. Without me, that universe is incomplete. But without that universal force, I don't exist. So I always maintain that the will of the divine 
does not take one where the grace of the divine cannot protect one. My entire journey for the last 37 years, right from the moment I've been born for the last 56 years, has been a divine grace. So that's a little bit. And here I am in this program. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And it's been quite a journey. You have been in this uh, LND space. I was reading somewhere at some Gallup poll which said 85% of the employees in, in, in a corporate are disengaged. In the learning and development space, is there something that can be done to ensure that the percentage comes down and employees are more engaged? Yes, yes. You know, we, we hear this famous quote which says that if you think training is expensive, try ignorance. Why, why someone has said that? Why Peter Drucker has said that? There's a reason, isn't it? Today, particularly today, the way we are and the way the world is progressing, you know, most of the world is still work from home and it's a hybrid model that is going on. If we don't upskill our people, I think it's going to be, the, the future is not somebody who is not educated. The future, you know, doesn't belong to somebody who doesn't upgrade on a day-to-day -day basis. You may be educated, but if you if you don't continue with that education and take it forward and don't upgrade on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I say upgrade, upgrade doesn't necessarily mean only your technical stuff, only your domain knowledge. There's so much more to learn in this world. And so I, I jokingly sometimes say that everything you do, everything, everything you do, become a liar. Jhoot mat bolo, but become a liar. Don't say lies. But what's a liar? It's an acronym I have created. Learn, internalize, apply, and reteach it to somebody else. Because when you have to reteach it, you have to continue to learn, internalize, and keep applying what you do. And that's the only way. I think, I think the millennials today, the Gen Z today, are, are so much, you know, uh, they're facing an information overload, I feel the way things are happening across the world. And because of that, they are not even sure what to read, what not to read, what to ignore, what to put emphasis on, what to learn. There is a lot that can be done in this space. So I think all organizations, and they're getting there. It, it's happening. I mean, some of the organizations that I'm engaging with right now, they are talking about introducing LMSs, giving them short courses, giving them regular trainings. I think team building is catching up like, you know, how GST was about a few years ago when it was introduced, because people are coming back from the, you know, the COVID era and a lot of camaraderie needs to be built back. So a lot of opportunities are coming there. And I think that's the only way to progress for this. That's nice to hear. That's nice to hear corporates are alive to the situation. But there's another disturbing statistics that I read somewhere, and you mentioned about uh, Gen Z. Uh, what I read was their working horizon is not beyond two years. So whatever a company does, will they be able to retain this Gen Z generation? So as I look at it today, it's not a question of loyalty anymore. Gone are those days. Like, for example, when I said in my journey, I started from AF Ferguson and then it moved into the media and the advertising space. One of the organizations in between, I worked only for one year. And I worked for one year because we were grilled in our head saying that don't leave an organization within one year. It doesn't look good on your resume. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days. Now the, the Gen Z, the millennials, they are looking more at, am I being respected in my organization? Am I getting to do what I love? Money is not the big criteria for them. Maybe because of the fact that we have seen so many revolutions happening in this world. You know, milk revolution was one of the revolutions. The dot-com revolution was another one, the bubble bursting and whatever happened. And then when 2008 recession started, I think the social revolution started then. And now the new revolution, which is, you know, you, you must have heard of pedagogy, 
the science behind teaching children or the art of teaching children, andragogy, the art of engaging with adults, mm -hmm. and the latest buzzword is hutagogy, H-E-U-T-A-G-O-G-Y. Hutagogy is self-paced learning. People don't want to be taught anymore. The millennials don't want to be taught anymore. They are okay with making mistakes. They are okay to unlearn, relearn, and, and go that extra distance. But one thing I have noticed, and I'm not saying we didn't have it, whatever they focus on, they are really doing that well. And in quicker time than what we used to manage to be able to do. So I don't see any reason why uh, you know, changing jobs in two years or that's not going to be any more a criteria I feel going forward. It's what you bring to the table. What value can you add into the into the organization? And, and that's how things are going to go, I, I feel, Premraj. So, Thank you. That's a nice way to put it. And that's a nice analysis too of Gen Z. There's another thing, which uh, again, a statistics, which uh, said uh, when an employee quits, right, 95% of the Times an employee doesn't leave an organization, he leaves his immediate supervisor. Right. So, are we doing anything to sensitize supervisors to ensure retention happens? Sure. I think the the kind of uh, leadership that is developing. So, because again, we are looking just like the Gen Z is now coming and taking over. I think there is a shift happening in the generation of leaders that has led the corporate world. So again, without naming anybody, this is not a personal interview or anything like that against or for anybody. We, we are seeing that shift happening from people who have been first on the first generation entrepreneurs or business owners to now their next generation taking over. And obviously these people have been educated in a different way, brought up in a different way. <clears throat> And I think the, the only ones who are stuck in between is this generation that is right now here. We are stuck between our forefathers and fathers and this new generation, and we are seeing that gap, both of us. Both, both we have seen what has happened. So our forefathers or fathers probably had to work because they had no other choice, number one. Certain people had the power. India had just got independence and certain people came to power. They had the money to invest and create factories, organizations. And our forefathers, fathers went and worked there because they had no other choice. Mm -hmm. Then came the next generation, our fathers, who made sure that at least they're building something for us. They took those little loans here and there and, and made sure that we got decent amount of education. Then came our generation which probably has built everything in a platter for the new generation that has come up. And, and if you see, even in corporates, that is what is happening. So for a leader who was in a position of power earlier, today probably needs to demonstrate that, hey, I, I need to earn that respect of a millennial or, or a Gen Z or whoever. You can't just command it. You can't just demand it just because you have the authority and the power. So a leader who is actually spending more time with the down the level people, motivating them, grooming them, mentoring them, coaching them, being one amongst them is the leader that is becoming more and more successful. So it's like, uh, I'm sure all of you have heard Prakash Ayer is one of my heartfelt mentors. And, and he gives this analogy of a tea bag being a leader. You know, when the, when the tea bag is put into the hot water, it brews. And the hotter the water, the stronger it brews. So we need leaders like that. So the hot water is nothing but the tough situations of life. And sometimes you need more than one, because if somebody needs a stronger tea, you need more than one tea bag. So you need more than one leader, symbolically, metaphorically speaking. And then some people prefer to add milk and sugar. How can you ignore your team members? The team members are your milk and sugar. And, and many leaders know that the tea bag is not drunk. The tea bag is always kept outside. It's the tea that is drunk. And they have to make way for the new. They know that. And those are the leaders who create better leaders. And they know that their string is always, always held by somebody else. 
isn't it? The Chaprasi reports to the security head, security head to the HR maybe. The HR reports to the, the CEO, the CEO to the board and the board to the shareholders and all of us report to the one up there. So obviously we all need to realize that our time is limited as a leader. What can I download in that period? How can I create more leaders rather than creating more team members? Is what I think the, the new block of leaders need to look at and need to groom themselves, need to coach themselves, need to acquire that knowledge and take it forward from there. Sir. That's beautiful about that tea bag analogy. And when Thank we you. talk about leaders creating more leaders, we have Absolutely. one set of leaders who are these micromanagers. Right. And because of this micromanagement, a lot of toxicity emerges in the corporate. So right. how is it that one deals with such type of people in the present environment? So if you ask my view on micromanagement, look, I have handled teams. I have, I have handled large teams in terms of uh, the largest I have handled is about 180 plus people reporting to me. So when I was the, the regional, the finance director over in Middle East and North Africa, can I micromanage each one of them at that time? Today, we, today possibly it is possible with all this connectivity that is there. Zoom was not there that time. Mm -hmm. You know, all this bandwidth and, you know, we, we need to go through some lease lines and invest a lot of money to be able to get to even that kind of connectivity. Mm -hmm. What do you do? <clears throat> if you ask me, I think trust, building of that trust, Trust is the bedrock of all relationships, all relationships, be it, you know, personal, professional, business, anything you put, you need to build that trust in an individual. Now, what is trust? It's, it's a big word. Trust requires at times unconditional surrender. At times, I'm not saying all, at times. Let me give you an example. There are two buildings like this, 40 story buildings. And there's a tight rope. And then there's a man walking on it, balancing with a stick, with a child on his shoulder. <clears throat> a lot of people are watching from below. Hey, he's going to fall. Take care, take care. Be, be careful. And that man crosses that about 800 meters or, they, or that they are apart. Super. Now he comes down and everybody is taking selfies with him. And so he asks a simple question. What do you think? Can I go back from here to there? <laughs> Sir, we will bet our bottom dollar on you. You'll make it. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much for showing so much of trust on me. Will one of you come? I'll carry you on my shoulder. And then there is pin drop silence and everybody's. This is the problem. On the face of it, a lot of those people who are working with leaders or even leaders talk about all these big jargons and you know but when it comes to the real world are they willing to jump and do and you know uh, do justice to that trust first of all do the leaders trust them and if they trust them are they willing to let go we just spoke about the tea bag analogy where the leader knows that the the tea bag is not drunk and more often than not it will be put out sometime so if you're going to any way go out why not create a legacy and go no <clears throat> why are you holding on to stuff the only way you'll get more stuff to give is by giving i i you know saw this video from nana patekar a beautiful video. He does a lot of work for uh, farmers, you know, the, the, the people who are striving to, you know, create this world and make India a better place. 70% of India is still agricultural, I feel. So they, they, are, they are actually struggling and he does a lot of work for them. So in one of the videos, it's in Marathi, in one of the videos, he says, God has given us two hands, probably a divine indication that you can only hold that much in two hands. And if you try to hold beyond that, it's going to fall down. And before it falls down, give it off to the people. Because anyway, it's going to fall down otherwise. So why are we holding as leaders? What is the fear? I think it's just a fear 
or an insecurity complex that le doesn't let these people share. So the only way they will be able to create or you know give recognition to these millennials, I think, is to trust them. Let them make those mistakes. As long as they are not grave blunders, the leader is there to take care of it. And I think they need to let go of. And, and this is what I'm learning. Whatever I'm learning, what's the point in keeping it with me? So I try to give it off. Sometimes free, but unfortunately, in this materialistic world, you need something called as money to live, to live, to sustain. So if everything is given free, I think it's losing its value. So at times, yes, I do give a lot of stuff free, but then <clears throat> put a value to it. So that you bring, you put something on the table, then you take responsibility for learning. You don't put something on the table, you don't take responsibility for learning. So I'm here to give you all that support and help you. But what are you doing there? So that's the question I ask the millennial many times. I ask this to my daughter. You, you tell me what you want from me. I'll give it to you. But what are you doing? And, and let me also give you another beautiful concept here. So uh, let me see if my, I'll just try just a second. Let me try if my whiteboard works and I'm going to try and share it with all of you. And if, if it works, brilliant. If it doesn't work, I switch back to my talk. All right. Is the line visible? Yeah, it's visible. Brilliant. Okay. So God is great. <laughs> so above the line is something called as or, and below the line is something called as bed. Now, people below the line are generally told as unsuccessful mindset. People who are below the line. And people who are above the line are the opposite. They are the ones with successful mindset. Now, what is this concept? <clears throat> people who are below the line generally blame. Generally blame. So they blame others. Uske wajay se nahi ho raha hai. Ye team member ke wajay se nahi ho raha hai. Mujhe ye dete nahi hai. Mujhe wo karte nahi hai. They keep blaming others. They give excuses. Excuses. I can't get up late. You know, I, I'm a nighty. I, I need to study in the night. I'm not able to sit through this. They give hazar excuses. Teacher always is like this. And they live in denial. As if the Nile is just a river in Egypt. After doing all this, after doing blame, excuses, don't live in denial, except the fact that things can go wrong. But people who are above the line take ownership, accountability, accountability, and responsibility. This is a beautiful concept that I, that I teach in most of my trainings. And I teach this in colleges. I teach this whenever I go to offices, organizations. I said, where are you? Always keep looking in life. Where are you? I'm not saying that you may not come here. Yes, it is possible. But how quickly can you come back to the above the line is what determines whether you're a good leader, good uh, you know, subordinate, good worker, whoever you are. Whoever you are, just imagine eight years back, nine years back, <clears throat> a director in an organization quits a job where he's, he's earning decent money, decent perks, all the other incentives, everything is there. And he leaves that. And the first training he does is for 3,000 rupees a day. That is my first training. I got 3,000 rupees for doing an eight almost eight and eight and a half hours of training. And having consistently done it, I, I could have resorted to blame, excuses, denial, right? But I chose it. I chose the field to do it. And if I chose choose something, then it is my ownership, my accountability, my responsibility, which will allow me to progress in that field. I can't keep giving excuses can't keep blaming the, the environment or can't live in denial. To give you another exercise, COVID, I mean, example, COVID came. 
lot of people thought business has gone down. A lot of things happened. Yes, business did go down. For one or two months, even we were down. We sat as a family and we figured out, okay, how much is there in the coffer? We don't know when this is going to get over. We don't know when things are going to start. We don't know what is going to happen. But how much is left in the coffer? What are the fixed expenses that we have, which we have to still pay our, our electricity bill, our telephone bills, our, our insurance premium, and all that is not going to go away. So we figured out that we have enough in the coffer for about one and a half years. Not bad. Even if nothing comes, we are okay. That's why I said the, the brain drain happened, but some money gain happened in that process. This is divine grace. Now, if you just sit and keep blaming the circumstances, are you going to be able to do anything in your life? Nothing. So I started upskilling initially. When I say upskilling, today what you're seeing on screen is a, is a result of that upskill is a result of some investments I made in buying certain things which will help me to present things like this. So leaders who can take that responsibility on themselves and make sure that their team members don't go below the line are the ones who will create more leaders. And, and come to think of it, if you think of this as water, if you sit on a bed, what is going to happen? The bed is going to soak all the water and you'll drown. But if you have an oar in your hand, and if you can find a wooden log, at least you can sit on it and use the oar to reach a bank somewhere. Take ownership, take accountability, take responsibility, isn't it? Upar jane ke baad, they say, when the flight goes up, and if there is a drop in the temperature, oxygen masks like this will come down. Pull them towards you and breathe normally. Before assisting your co-passengers, Please wear your own masks. Please take ownership, accountability, and responsibility for yourself first. And this is something I think every millennial, every Gen Z should be taught. So that is what I would I would do if I were a leader. Sir. Beautiful, beautiful <clears throat> examples. And those examples are so, so very relevant. Thank you. The oar, the bed, and all those acronyms that you put up. Ownership accountability, responsibility, rather than blame, excuses or denial. That's yeah. Just this one thing, if somebody takes away from this talk, I think his or her day will be done. His life will be sorted, I'm telling you. Thank it's you. a very, very powerful concept. <clears throat> it, it is a powerful concept and it takes some time to ingest it too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, when we were in the corporate, at least when I was in the corporate, this concept of uh, emotional intelligence, I'd never heard about it. Right. And now suddenly if we keep hearing this is going to be one of the top skills in the next decade. Right. So what's your take on it? Well, look, emotional intelligence, when you, you know, two contradictory words, isn't it? You, you can't be intelligent and emotional at the same time. Same time. However, uh, a lot of research has happened. I'm, I'm a certified uh, emotional intelligence coach. I went through that process as well. So what I've learned, let me just try to summarize in the next five minutes. You, you ask this question to anybody in the world who is an expert on emotional intelligence. They will tell you that you can't manage emotions. It's a myth that you can manage emotions. Emotions are biological and instinctual. They are inbuilt in a human being. In the wake of those disruptive emotions, how do you manage yourself is being emotionally intelligent. Let's take a simple example. And this is probably the, the biggest treatise or example the whole world has seen experienced. And that is Lord Krishna facilitating an emotional intelligence session in the battlefield of Kurukshetra to Arjuna. Look at that gentleman. Highly intellect, highly intellect. Uh, I mean, it, if, you, if you hear the shloka, dhyana shloka, sarvopanisha dogaho dogda gopala nandanaha partho valsa sudhir bhokta dugdam gitam ritam mahat. This is a shloka. Who is doing? Sarva upanishad. All the Upanishads, all the scriptures are 
nothing but like cows. Sarvopanisha dogavo. Who is milking them? Dogda Gopala Nandanaha. The milk, the cow herd is Lord Krishna. What is he doing? And who is he doing it for? Parth is Arjun. Partho Vals. Vals means like a little child. He has knelt down in front of him. I am giving up. Please help me. And but who is he? Sudhir Bhokta. Highly intellectual. What did the divine do? Dukdam Gita Mritam Mahat. Like nectar, like milk, he gave him that entire gist of emotional intelligence. And then after that, he said, I am not going to tell you what is to be done. You do what is right. Isn't it? Even that facilitator is saying the same thing. You do what is right. You take a decision. I don't want my decision to be imposed on you. <clears throat> Interesting. Let's look at another real life example of the current era. We all know of the great mishaps that have happened in the financial world. Be it Enron, be it Lehman Brothers, be it Satyam. Let's look at Satyam because it, it fits into this con context very well. Again, the man, Ramalingam La Raju. Who is he? Highly intellect, right? Winner of two Golden Globe Awards for Transparency. Yeah, the name awesome. of the company itself stands for Truth, Satyam. Mm -hmm. In a moment of emotional turmoil and love towards his son's organization called Mitis, spelt in a reverse order, it is nothing but Satyam started playing around with the numbers in the balance sheet and cooking up and, and, you know, he cooked it up to such an extent that now look at his intelligence. He knew that if he gets caught by the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, he's going to, his life is going to be hell. Goes and surrenders to the Sebi or the Indian government saying, I am riding on a tiger. Again, an intellectual decision However, he had to manage his emotions at that point of time to be able to take that decision. And then the rest is history. We know what happened after that. We, let's not get into that. So five key aspects is nothing but first is becoming aware, the self-awareness that set in at that point in that gentleman. What am I doing? What have I done already? That awareness set in. And then managing yourself in the wake of those disruptive emotions. And then the third aspect is, of course, understanding others. This is where empathy plays a big role. You know, we say that one has to be empathetic. Today's leaders have to be empathetic. Today's employees have to be empathetic. What is empathy? <clears throat> you ask anybody, they'll say, put yourself into the shoes of the other person. Feel what the other person is feeling and do something if it is required. Good, great definition. But there is a precursor to that. Before getting into somebody's shoes, you have to remove your own shoes. How will you get into somebody else's, else's shoes with your own shoes on? That removal of your shoes is a metaphor or a simile or whatever is similar to keeping your biases, your judgments, your stereotyping aside. That's the basic quality to understand somebody else. Isn't it? As a leader, if you need to understand your team members, don't have any bias towards them. As a, as a team member, if you have to work with a leader, don't have a, a judgment about what he does or what she does. Keep that aside. Then you will be able to feel what he feels. You don't know what he is undergoing at the top. <clears throat> You're concerned with what is happening to you. Same way, you are undergoing something at the top, well unaware of maybe something is happening at the bottom level. So it's a two-way traffic. And then last is motivation. Again, motivation is internal. It's never, ever been external. External can give you inspiration, but unless you're motivated from within, how will you do something? And we have enough examples, whether it is Arunima Sinha or you, there are enough examples on motivation, which says that people with those, again, wrong word, they are, they are intellectually challenged or they are differently abled. Let's not even call them disabled. They're differently abled. They have achieved far more than people with all the abilities have achieved, isn't it? Whether it's a Nick Wojcik or, or or there are so many people like that. So emotional intelligence is one of the most important topics today because beyond a point, intelligence doesn't grow. Your IQ doesn't grow. 
but EQ, whether it is uh, Mayor Salloway or Caruso, or whether it is Daniel Goldman or whoever, Rivon Baron, all these people have called it an ability. An ability is a skill. And if it is a skill, it can be developed throughout. And I think that's one of the purposes of the human being. You will become biologically mature. You don't need to do anything. Dadi aega, hair will grow, uh, go gray. You'll become bald. You'll become old. All that is a biological process. But you can still remain emotionally immature inside. So the, it is a process I think everybody needs to undergo. And that's why it is important to introduce it in the schools. And they're doing so with the new education policy, national education policy. And it will only mean that people who are more emotionally stable will come out in the days to come. So that is the reason why emotional intelligence is getting its popularity. And it's no, no new concept. As I said, Gita is, a, is the biggest example. So that is what I would say, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was quite a session. And now <laughs> I'd like to open the session to the participants. If anyone has any questions, you can unmute and ask. Yeah, Pail, please. Yes. So yes, thank Pail. you. Thank you so much, Shankarji, for gracing Bloom platform. So far, uh, this is our third Christmas, Bloom third Christmas, and your session was an eye-opener. It's like a mini masterclass. So we look forward for an yet again a big uh, major masterclass with Bloom. Please and, call in. Uh, yeah, my question to you is in today's scenario, when it comes to leadership, keeping the COVID scenario in mind, uh, right. what is the highest quality a leader should possess? Highest quality? Yes. I think one is being empathetic. Because if, if you are empathetic, I'll give you an example. She's not even a leader. We are talking about leadership. And I this changed my life. This, this story that I'm going to tell you changed my life. Period. I didn't even see any other videos. And I, whenever I'm down, I go and see that video. It's a video by Radhanath Swami. And it's a story that he says in about 12 minutes of this lady called Sindhu Tai Sakpa. Uh, she's no more. She passed away. But that lady was born in the, in the interiors of the Maharashtra villages. And at the age of eight, she got married. At the age of 19, she had three children and she was carrying the fourth. A mafia type of a person who was controlling the entire village used to really, really do, you know, uh, put the ladies in a lot of hardships and exploit them. Sindhu I went and complained against him and got him arrested. Now, this guy came out on bail and told Sindhu Thai's husband that, what are you doing? You know, your, your wife is having affairs with so many people in this village. You are, you are an idiot. In fact, the child in her womb is my child. And if you don't kill the child, I'll kill you. Now, in order to kill the child and Sindhu Thai, that man starts kicking her in the stomach. She falls unconscious. He drags her to a cow shed and leaves her there, thinking that people will think that the cows trampled her and that's how she died. But Divine Grace has something else written always for all of us. A cow stood over her, protecting her. So when her in-laws went to see if she has actually passed away or not, the cow did not allow them, allow them to come near her. She gives birth under that cow. She says, I took a, a stone and, and it took me about 20 slices to come out of, cut that umbilical cord. Can you, can you imagine the, these scenes? And then I'm cutting the story short. It, it became a depressing life for her because her in-laws did not take her. Her own family rejected her. She used to live in a graveyard. And whatever people used to put in the last rites, she'll take that and she'll, put it in water and cook it on the pyre of the dead body. And that's how she used to eat and feed her child. So she says it became a very depressing life. And so she wanted to commit suicide. She goes to the railway tracks. She's lying there with a child. And as the train is coming, she hears somebody crying. And so she thinks, who is this crying, howling like this? So she gets up and sees that it's a very, very invalid person begging for food. And so she begs for him 
and gets him food. And she says, that day, for me, that was the voice of Krishna, saying that you have a higher purpose in life. And but again, she says, I went and stood under, a, I mean, sit, sat under a tree and, and what do I do? I have nothing. I have no one. And then she suddenly looks up and sees that there is a branch which is hanging just by a string. A woodcutter has cut it very, very harshly. It's just hanging by a string, but it is providing shade to the, the two of them. And she says, I got my answer. That no matter however beaten you are, you can still give a lot back to this world. And then she started picking up abandoned children and the rest is history. When she passed away, she had she has more than 1,500, 2,000 children. Many of them are farmers, lawyers, chartered accountants, engineers, leading a great life. What did she have? She had nothing. She had nothing, literally nothing. And if she could transform the world like that, people like us, we have knowledge, we have skill, we have all the resources, we have money, everything we have. But if we can put this on the foundation of being compassionate, and that's empathy, each and every one of us can have a significant influence in this world, is this. significant influence, provided we believe that we are a mere instrument of that divine grace, and that is functioning through us. Each and every one of us can have an influence, but one has to become aware of that. And that's why I said that one single quality that a leader should have is empathy. And there are, again, innumerable stories on empathy, seriously. How Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, sir, took the children of his colleague to an exhibition, you know, after giving him permission to leave the office, the man doesn't leave. He's so engrossed in his work that he doesn't leave. So at at 5.15, he took permission to go home at 5.30. So at 5.15, APJ sir goes to his house and takes his children to the exhibition. This man comes home at 8 o'clock and uh, very dejected. His wife asks, should I make coffee or will you have dinner? And he says, I'm so sorry, darling. I think children will be very angry, right? And she says, you don't know? Your boss came and took them to the exhibition. Does the boss need to do this every time? No. No. But that one time, people will die for you. Yeah. That's being empathetic. When he gave that okay for the leave, it was a leader giving that okay for a leave. But when he went home and took the children, it was a father. He was not married, but it was that fatherly quality which made him take that decision. That's empathy for me. And that's, I think, the most important quality a leader should have. Apart from everything, knowledge, yes, all that, yes. But if you're not empathetic, you won't have a good team. So hope it answers your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shankar, sir. Uh, in Bloom Platform Room, we are having Brigadier, sir, Dr. Alka, if you have any oh, wow. questions for our speaker. Wow. Namaste, it's Deepak, sir. Merry Christmas to all of you. Oh, I could ask a question by the time others decide. Hello, Shankar. Okay, sorry, please. you couldn't be there. Otherwise, I would have been co-hosting along with Prem Raj. Please go ahead, sir. Please go ahead. So, uh, I just want to ask these two questions and these are related to your story which you shared with us. You shared about your dad calling you up and saying, you know, wherever you are, leave and come and join me. How difficult or how easy was it for you to take that decision and how were you able to convince your family that this is what we've done and this is the way forward? How did you do that? So, uh... This was a second decision, actually, I took. So it was a little more easier than the first one. So the first one had happened in 1999. 99 February, to be precise. You know, I, I think you joined in a little late and you would have missed that part where I worked in one organization for only one year. Yeah, I heard that, yeah. Yeah, so that was the organization which I left. And, and the reason was 7th of February, 1999, my daughter was born. After a long gap, we got married in 93. Uh, we lost twins in 94. And then after a long gap of about four or five years, my daughter was born. So, and then that job was getting to my nerves. That I mean, I don't want to get into that at all, the discussion. So that was difficult because... Because that job actually catapulted me to believe that, hey, I have arrived in life. Because my journey was here in terms of 
A. F. Ferguson. The next job took me to here, and then this job actually took me there, in terms of money, in terms of perks, and all that. So to leave that job was a little, very difficult, without a job in hand. Coming back to the uh, Dubai affair, yes, it was difficult. I, I will lie if I said it was not difficult. However, what had happened slightly before that was that we all took a cut in salary because of recession and and the way the organization was heading and the way I was actually heading there in terms of my own role, what I was doing and all that. Probably in hindsight, when I think now, I would have saturated maybe in a year. And, and this is exactly what my dad said. If you don't leave Shankar now, you'll probably be forced to leave. And I thank him for that, having that foresight at that point of time. Yes, it was difficult, emotionally difficult, financially difficult, but it happened after six years. See the divine grace. By then, as I said, the coffers were reasonably full for me to take that decision and, and not have an iota of doubt that if we come back and if I don't earn for the next three to five years, we're still not going to starve in this country. The difficult part was not leaving the job. The difficult part was taking up another job in India. Because to move from a salary here, and when I left the country, I was here, yeah. that, that gap was too wide. Yeah. And obviously, the Gulf experience is not counted in a place like India. <laughs> so, so there is no service tax, there is no income tax, there is no financial accounting laws, there's nothing there except IFRS. And IFRS, even in those days, was just about taking shape in a bigger way. It yeah. is not as strong as it is today. Yeah. So people used to still say that you are still here. If you want to come and join here, whether it's a CFO, whether whatever it is, and so at that time, sir, the best option for me was to join a consulting group where I get to learn and I get paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> and that learning process was faster because it's a consulting group. It is not an organization where seriously I have to sit and take decisions immediately on this income tax, filing this, that, that. I don't have to take that decision. I have to do a little bit of a postmortem of what has happened as an auditor. So it can be there. So, yes. Well, so if, if, if the same situation were to happen with you, and just assuming you had two sons, would your sons do what you did? I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess uh, the way the way we are, we are bringing up our children, we, yeah. we hope, and the rest is divine grace. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever they do, I think they will do as per what that, that grace's will is, not my will. And that's why I said in the beginning itself that the will of the divine does not take one where the grace of the divine cannot protect one. But do we believe in that grace? Do we believe in that grace is a question to ask. Yeah, that's the problem. It takes your hair to go gray before you start understanding and believing things. <laughs> so, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. I mean, we've had a great end to the year, the last show of 2022 with Shankar Vishwanath. I mean, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank you for what thank you've you. said, for what you've shared to us. It has been indeed a revelation. So many things, uh, those three things, if you could repeat those three things where you said, you know, uh, teaching children, teaching parent and self-studies, those ologies, if you could repeat yeah. those three. Sure, I think Alka Ji wants to ask something or say something. Let us say, and then I, will, I, I, will. I just want to add one thing and uh, congratulations for the beautiful share. I, although I joined late, I got the crisp part of your talk and you are speaking absolutely from your heart. And Sindhu Thai's story is very, very dear to me and it inspires me a lot. But what I'm saying is that what you said about leaving the job. So when we leave our, you know, full-fledged job, which is very safe and which is very secure, there is something in our heart which tells us that we can make it out of yes. this job. That we come out yes. of this job, and it is yes. a divine. It is a divine intelligence in, in whom we have the faith and in whom we have that connection, and that what makes us go through. And I'll tell you one thing. Even when I left my job, you know. I was thinking that when I start my private practice, I'm a doctor, by the way, and um, I was having a very secure post of associate professor's post in the medical college. And it was, a, it was a good income. I was paying my installments of my house, but I had to still leave because my children were very small. Both my kids were like 
three and one and a half like this. And I had to leave because I had to give them time. So I could take a clinic close to my house. So I could hop, right. skip and jump between the two. But at that time, the fear was there inside me. But there was one thing which kept me going. And that was the purpose of my life. That purpose was that I have to give them a good time, a good education, a lot of love. And they have to flower be convert karna hai so that purpose of my life which was to kept me going and i had full faith in that intelligence you know the higher super intelligence that, that he's going to help me and frankly speaking three days after i moved to my new house i was all alone and i was crying and crying uh, in the middle of the night because my husband had a secure job he didn't leave his job he went to work and on the third day of his job he walked in with a beautiful girl who was wearing a frock but she was a little elderly and i said who is this so he said She's going to be your maid and she's going to look after you and the children. And I asked him one question. No, I asked him one question. Where are we going to pay him? We pay her from? She said, we, we, something will happen. And it so happened that God made the way and we got the money to pay that maid. Because she came into my life, I could leave my house and I could go and look, look for my place for my new Absolutely. clinic and, you know, look for my children's schools and all Correct. of that. So I'm just Correct. saying that what you said was so beautiful, the grace of I, God. I will add two things to it. You finish, I'll add two things. After. Thank you so much yes. for that. Thank you. It, Thank you for sharing that. Let me add two more God. things. Let me add two more things, Alkaji, in that. And the first thing is that I had no liabilities on my head. You know, that is again divine grace. At the point in time when I took the call, there was not a single loan or a liability to be paid off. So no EMIs, no nothing, nothing, nothing. Number one. Number two, when we discussed as a family, so me, my wife, my daughter, she said, Shankar, it's been 21 years now. We, we are married. At least I'll get to see you here at home. Otherwise, you've been like a, a man living out of a suitcase and, you know, you, you've been that jet jet based auditor and whatever, finance professional. You have seen the world literally being in Dubai. You've been to Egypt and Lebanon and Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria and wherever. But where did you take me? Except for Singapore and Sri Lanka, which we did as holidays. But other than that. So at least I'll be very happy that you'll be home. And what do I want? You, you keep giving me that 30, 40, maybe 50,000 rupees per month. That's it. I'm not going to ask you anything more. Biggest strength for me was that. Biggest strength was that. And, and that helped me to take that decision to, to add on to your answer more, Deepak ji. And that, that's the, that helped me take that decision even in a bigger way. Yeah. So thank you, Alkaji, for sharing that. Appreciate it. You know, that music director, Khayam, you know, he was giving a talk like this only one day. He, he sang a beautiful song. And when, when we were all congratulating him, he added one sentence. And I just reminded of that. And that gives yeah. the, uh, the, uh, yeah. the performer that, you know, the courage to go ahead in life. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alka. Brigadier Basin, any thoughts? Brigadier, yeah, sir, I've been a follower of Brigadier, sir, for long. The man <laughs> of the time man, the yeah, time management you. guru. <laughs> Brigadier, sir, so beautiful to have you in this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. I uh, I did join late because I normally have a session every Sunday that uh, went a little longer today. So, uh, yeah, it's been a very good conversation. And, I, you know, every time when I'm listening to people, it obviously... Uh, helps you relate to your own life and to many things. So the two things, uh, and I know that there's shortage of time. Abhi Deepak ki ghanti ban jayegi lunch ki. So, <laughs> uh, see, one was empathy he talked about. And I learned a lot of it right in the earlier stages of my army career when I was just a captain. And... Uh, I like to share one person who now lives in Navi Mumbai. He is my godfather. He was the best senior I ever served under. And I learned a lot from him. His name is Brigadier Dharam Prakash. He was a commanding officer at that time. And we were just four officers in uh, Far East and North. Uh, you know, I used to never say Eastern. Uh, you know, people say Northeast. And I used to say Far East because uh, it was the easternmost part of the country. We were in Tinsukia. And uh, go a little further east and you are in Burma. So that was uh, the place. No, we were staying in a tea garden. Uh, our unit was surrounded by tea gardens on the three sides. And it was a very remote place. 
एंड वी फोर ऑफिसर सो हमारे चार ऑफिसर्स की ही वो दुनिया थी तो देर वॉज अकेंड लेफ्टिनेंट ओनली वन पर्सन आई जूनियर टू मी सो टू गो फॉर पी टी इन द मॉर्निंग एंड यूज टू कम बैक एंड हैव अ कप ऑफ टी विद मी एंड देन गो फॉर ब्रेकफास्ट एक आदत थी कि हम पीटी के बाद आते थे and my wife would get up in the morning make a cup of tea for us and we would maro a little gap shop go the rest of the day we knew that humko time nahi milega barabar and one day uh, he told me ki he had a bike he had a very uh, he had a yesd bike so one day coming back and uh, before we were to turn right to our bang uh, to our bashas which were uh, uh, temporary houses that we had Uh, he said, आप चलो मैं आता हूँ मैं जरा इसको थोड़ा बाइक को घुमा के लाता हूँ बहुत दिनों से ये चली नहीं है स्टैटिक खड़ी है सो ही वेंट अवे एंड आई वेंट एंड आई माई वाइफ टू मेक अ कप ऑफ टी बट बिफोर द टी वॉज रेडी देर वॉज अ गाय केम रनिंग टू माई हाउस एंड ही सेट सर लेफ्टिनेंट साहब का एक्सीडेंट हो गया एंड आई डेंट आई डेंट अंडरस्टैंड हाउ यार अभी तो ये ठीक ठीक ठाक था और यहाँ पे क्या छोटी सी रोड है कहाँ एक्सीडेंट हो जाएगा so he had probably hit into a into a bullock cart and uh, fell off the bike and he apparently had a head injury so i quickly went out now there was no other vehicle commanding officer's vehicle was there wah chabi humko pata kahan rehti thi because for emergency we knew that that's the only vehicle we have i took out the commanding officer's jonga which normally one would never have the guts to do but you know when you are in an emergency like that i went and i found That we had a one ton also. The one ton was already there. उसको चार पाई पे डाल के वो laborers colony से निकल रहा था. तो laborers were putting him into the thing. I said, क्या हुआ? Sir, सिर से बहुत खून निकल रहा है. So I said, okay, let let's rush to the hospital. I didn't even go back. So I drove the jonga. We are not supposed to. We are not allowed to, and all on in those days. And I'm not even in uniform. I mean, you can't be driving a jonga in a in a PT dress. I did because that is what army taught us that these rules are okay for normal line, but emergency is emergency. So I went. He was taken into the OT and all that. Then I uh, there were no mobiles those days, so Correct. I went to the nearest phone and I rang up my commanding officer and I said, "Sir, I am sorry. I violated a lot of rules. This is what has happened. Vivek is in the hospital. Uh, he is in uh, the ICU. He's got a head injury." and uh, the doctors have only said one thing ki he is safe he is there's nothing very serious but they want to keep him under observation so abhi to ot mein hai wo uh, icu mein uh, sorry ha ot mein is coming out but he'll be in the icu for some time so he said uh, now how does he come because jonga to main leke aaya tha the commanding officer that day jab when i had left his car was standing outside his house With all the saman tied up, they were going on a one week's holiday as a family. So he said, "No, no, don't worry about." It. I said, "Sir, I'll come back to pick you up because there's no other vehicle." He said, "No, no, I'll come in my car." So he came in the car with still the baggage on top and all that. And uh, the moment uh, Vivek had come out, he was out of his senses. He saw the uh, CEO there. So he said, "Sir, आप कैसे आ गए? आप तो छुट्टी पे हैं." so he says how can i go on leave if you are in the hospital i have cancelled my leave there's no leave okay now that is the first thing that vivek was shocked about that for a second lieutenant who is just a piddly little chap the commanding officer is prepared to forego his personal leave and all that anyway long story short he was in the hospital for some time now there was another very serious thing happening he was getting married and he is from bihar aur usko ye tha ki agar mere in laws ko pata chal gaya ki meri head injury hui hai to uski wo market value kam ho jayegi the marriage may get cancelled so it was something that this marriage must go on 3 mahine hai 3 mahine mein i should become all right and i should never tell them that something like this ever happened so that the marriage goes on smoothly so now there was a thing that kisi ne unke parents ko nahi batana of course there was no social media so that was a saving grace uh and uh, now the hospital decided ki he has to be flown to calcutta for uh, to go to the big hospital to get a uh, specialist opinion and if he did that it would have actually now taken him much longer and he was scared ki agar wahan pe kuch nikal aaya to fir shaadi ka problem hoga 
So he expressed this to the commanding officer. The commanding officer made sure he didn't go to Calcutta. He went to go to Jorhat. Jorhat was also a bigger hospital. Made them take that decision. Then a lot of things happened. Uh, to go to Jorhat, there used to be a weekly aircraft going. And uh, he said, if you go by road, it'll be very long and also I'll put you on that aircraft. Again, a story of how he got to his Air Force cosmate and got him on the aircraft and all that. I'm telling you all that he did was that the marriage went on smoothly. I went with my little daughter who was just about six months young and that's that the first air flight she did in, air, in Indian Airlines. We went to attend his wedding. Uh, if Brigadier Dharam Prakash tells Vivek to walk on water, he'll do it. Yeah. He bought him. He, you know, he said, Ki, sir, how can a commanding officer do so much? A father will not do it for his own son. But he's the same commanding officer that there was a uh, there was a picnic, and we were four people and going for a picnic, and he was a RD officer, receipt and dispatch officer. And Sunday morning we have to go on, uh, on a picnic. Saturday night we get a message. Ki ek wagon lag hai. Wagon lag hai means ki now the RD officer has to be on the station to see that the wagon is on uh, offloaded on time. So I walked up to the CEO and I said, sir, we are only four officers. We are going for a picnic. So can today somebody else, like a junior commissioned officer, can he take on this responsibility and can, can come, can Vivek come? He says, Sushil, how did you even think of asking me for this? You know my orders are very clear. Personal uh, entertainment will never ever overtake official duty. Correct. We can cancel the picnic, but he will not. He has to attend to the wagon first, however trivial it may it might look to you. Because he used to tell us that these are habits you are forming up. If you have learned relax here, it will make it a habit. So he says, no, you are building up habits. No, we will go for the picnic. We went for picnic without Vivek. So that was the type of empathy either way. Right. Time mein kaam hai, but when it came to looking after, there was no going back. And right. I'm telling you this one of the hundreds of incidents in my life. And what right. I picked up from Brigadier Dharam Prakash, I think lots of people, my juniors would have similar stories to tell about me because I did the same. We picked it up. Right. So empathy, I think what you say in my leadership lessons, I always talk about empathy as the number one, number right. one skill. Or kuch bhi ho, agar empathy nahi hai, you cannot be a good leader. Right. As simple as that. Brilliant. Brilliant. So very nice to hear from you all. And uh, I thank, think... Thank you, Brigadier. Thank you for those inputs. We have exceeded one hour. And Shankar, this was a master class. Not a mini master, it was a master class. Thank you, you have a treasure trove of stories which you can regale the audience with. And looking thank forward you. for more such sessions sure, with you. Sure, sure. Thank you for your time. And thank you all the participants. Thank you all. Wish you all again a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Because the next time we meet, it will be the new year. Thank you. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. And God I hope you've clicked a couple of pictures, Pyle. Yes, yes, I have Great. done that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank God you. Bless you. Thanks. Bye.